Um, good morning, Harry. And it's good to hear you and see you in the studio. <laughs> good um, to see you, Tina. It's been a while. <laughs> It has. Um, and Harry said he was only going to come and do this interview if it was face-to-face, -face, and that's fair enough. Um, I haven't seen you for a while. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> and I think that's, a, that's probably more to do with the fact that you've been very busy uh, lately. So have you. Yeah, I have. I have. And not very successfully <laughs> oh, either. Oh, damn. I was looking forward to you being the mirror. I'm going to beat your chauffeur. <laughs> Driving Miss Daisy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or driving your man. <laughs> yeah, well, I, say, I tell you what, with the way this government's going, anyone in local government's going to be driven mad anyway. <laughs> it's not easy out there for, for local councillors. Mm. And uh, it's pretty hard when you have so much change in the legislation coming at you like they are. And and you, you've been in... And just for people's knowledge um, and to understand the dynamics between me and Harry, I was a prison social worker in 1987 in the Invercargill Jail and Harry was a worker for jails at the time? No, I was actually yeah, on a contract with the old Department of Justice back then. Right. Yeah, I finished in jails just prior to that. Yeah. That's right, because I'd done some work previously with jails and, yeah. and, and as well. Um, and so uh, we were having problems with some young inmates in the jail. Um, so what had happened was because of the muster numbers in the jails around the country, they were shifting a lot of inmates around the place. And so we ended up with all of these inmates from the North Island and they had a lot of ties to both Black Power and Mongrel Mob. And the jail had never really had that before. They had lots of the devil's henchmen and the road knights. And so suddenly, just overnight on a bus, um, there was about 20 of them. Mm. Um, and you can imagine what the dynamics were in the jail as a result of that. It wasn't easy. And I was a very young, inexperienced social worker. Never had any training. And um, But I had a, a really good superintendent whose name escapes me right at the moment. Frank Blake. Frank, Frank Blake. There you go. Harry's memory is better than mine. <laughs> and he just said, you do what you think you need to do. Um, to make lives better in here. And so against um, the wishes of most of the prison office staff, I brought Harry in, who at that stage was still recognised as a gang member, and they really were very, very anti it and made life pretty hard for me as a result. Try of being me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't... <laughs> It's all about Tina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, anyway, Harry came in, and it was it was a really interesting time because I think we did shift the dynamics in those days, or you mm. certainly did. Um, and um, uh, and you're right. All I really did was facilitate you coming in and working with some of those young guys, and they got some intensive help as a result mm. of that, uh, which um, some of them changed their lives. And um, from there, you've gone on to a number of different positions. Uh, you went into youth justice, uh, you the Ministry of Youth. Youth, youth Affairs. Youth yeah. Affairs. And then you were in TPK for a while? Yeah, I was in Department of Corrections for a couple of years. Yep. And then uh, TPK for 11. That's right. Yeah. So, um, as I said, Harry is a very interesting beast in terms of the fact that he's been on the outside <laughs> and the inside. Oh, yes, that beast. <laughs> Better not use that Don't word. Don't be a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and someone's just someone's just texted in and said, has Harry been busy selling meth? Well, I can tell you that the one thing that I do know absolutely 100% about Harry is he's anti-drugs, always has been. Um, and, and actually what he's done over the years is do everything he can to get the people that he works with off um, drugs. So, Harry, tell us a bit about what you're doing right now. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, right now I'm doing um, Section 27 cultural reports for the courts. And so uh, what are they for? They're um, for when people are going up for sentencing. It's kind of like an in-depth probation report. It looks at um, their, their disadvantages in life um, and, and also look at what are they prepared to do to try and make some changes. You know, basically the disadvantages that's contributed to their offending behaviour and what they like, um, need to do and what they, they're prepared to do. And through that, they are entitled to some discounts. Um, yeah, so I do that. Uh, we also run. Do you the think they actually work, Harry? Uh, yeah, I think they do. I, in fact, it's quite, been quite interesting because, like, it's I've become this um, mentor. A number of my clients have gone on, served, 
you know, some are still currently serving their prison sentences, and they've asked me to mentor them um, through their journey, which I thought, you know, quite remarkable. In fact, one of the guys, um, I'll tell you the story. I got this, you know, like the lawyers contact us. We do a quote, goes to League Wade, League Wade proves it. We go ahead and do the interview, and this guy was in Mount Eden. And, and I sort of looked at his name and I thought, should I think I know this name? And and he, he was actually a Black Power president. Anyway, this is during COVID, so going, going to Mount Eden, and we both had masks on, get into the interview room, and he says, is that, is, is that you, Harry? And I said, mm, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> you know, it just seems to be my standard reply these days. And he said, do you remember me? <laughs> <laughs> Do I remember you? Well, I've met so many people in my life. <laughs> and, I, and I had to say, um, you know, well, well, he did look familiar. And he was actually from Invercargill. Oh, right. Yeah. And um, and he was doing quite a, you know, he was up for some quite horrendous offending. And, and he said to me, he said, look, bro, he said, I'm really sick of, I'm really sick of this life. He said, you know, um, do what you can for me with your report. So I I'd done a good report for him, and this guy's been through all sorts of bloody trauma in his life, you know, from basically, if you look at his background, the guy didn't have a bloody chance, you know, mm. from virtually from birth. And anyway, I did his report, and the judge gave him some discount, but he ended up doing, I think he's doing about four years. And, um, and then he contacted me, he said, look, <clears throat> thanks very much for the report, it really reflected where I've been, and you know, can, can you mentor me while I do my sentence and after? Because you're the only person that I know that can probably help me get out of this lifestyle. So I've agreed to that, and so we keep in touch. Another chap that I did a report for, he he actually lived quite a sort of remarkable life. He um, he was born. His father was Pakia. His Māori, uh, his mother was Māori, and he was quite dark. And he said, my father's a racist. And <laughs> basically just beat the crap out of him because the father suspected he wasn't his child. Yeah. And this guy goes on, he's now into his um, early 50s. And he's, you know, through all this, the stuff that he's gone through, he actually came out reasonably well. And he was he was a, a tutor at, at, at a polytech and he's a tradesman and he's got his own, own business. But through the interview process, I managed to pick up something that he's never ever shared with anyone and that he'd actually been molested when he was when yep. he was a child by a woman. And and Wow. Yeah. And so he he actually just you know, yep. the emotions overtook him and, and um and it was good that his wife was there. And um and we managed like the the judge gave him a good sentence and um and again, he's another chap that's said to me, he said, look, thank you very much. This is something that I've never shared with anyone, least of all my, my wife, which I've shared everything with. And so they're now working on how to deal mm. with the, the trauma that he's... So, so to answer your question, mm. yes, I think they do work, mm. not just because it gets them a lighter sentence, but it actually confronts them with their own issues. And those that choose to take up the challenge to do something about it... Yep. Um, yeah, we make some progress there. And do they monitor them? I mean, this is the one thing I always worry about, the correction system, and, and with all of your best endeavours to not set up a programme but sort of chart a way through for um, the person that you're doing the cultural report for, who's coming in to actually check that some of those deliverables, for want of a better government term, are actually happening so that the, in, so that the person can actually deliver and... Less, and have less crime, basically, or commit less crime. I think my understanding of them, and that's talking to an ex-parole board member, is that these reports actually stay on their files. So wherever they go within the criminal justice system, their file will go with them. Yep. And so when the judge sentence these people, often they're, they're on supervision orders, and I guess that's where the probation service will come in and look at what their needs are, and they'll probably do their own assessments as well. Yep. But th that gets factored into it. So part of the supervision is like, have you attended to your trauma counselling or, or mm. whatever, right? So when they and if they're serving a term of imprisonment, when they're coming up for parole, the parole board members have the privilege of actually going through th 
their files so that all the stuff is documented. So, so yeah, there is a sort of monitoring process. And, well, it's not monitoring, but it's there yep. as information along with quite often their psychological reports, their AOD assessments and so forth. And what we find, a lot of our clients have a history <coughs> of trauma and intergenerational trauma. Yep. And so it's quite ingrained and, and these people kind of like end up in this sort of cycle where they can't get out of it. And, and you would have experienced that when you were working in Invercargill mm. prison. It's never what you'd see, you know, they commit horrendous crimes or whatever. That's what we look at. But behind that, mm. there's a whole set of triggers that why people behave like this. And that's the part that the public doesn't see. Yeah. And in some, some ways, that's a good thing because some of the stuff you wouldn't want to see. To oh, honest, honestly, you know? truly, yeah. It, and and yeah. that's where the misunderstanding comes in, where we just constantly think, oh, well, we just, you know, yep. punish them, make them better. But also what I find, a lot of my clients are institutionalised. They, they've been, you know, like a chap that's in his 50s and he spent his entire adult life in jail. In, in, in going in and out of jails. So, so many of my clients that have, you know, when you look at their criminal record, there isn't a year in their adult life that they haven't been in prison. Yep. And then you kind of wonder why they, they can't make decisions, they can't do things for themselves because they're waiting to be, you're told when to wake up, you know when you're going to get fed and you don't deal with your finances and these people have got no idea. Yep. In fact, one chap said to me, he said, look, Harry, I, I, I don't need rehabilitation. What I need is reintegration. Mm. I was sort of scratching my head, what do you mean, bro? And he said, well... I've got no ID, man. Yep. I've got, yep. you know, when I come out of prison, I mean, you know, what am I going to eat? You know, because, because I, and it started off when I was asking, because when I looked at his rap sheet, it was all burglaries and, and shoplifting. I said, bro, you're a gangster, you know? Yeah, <laughs> Kinda, yeah. You know, you're supposed to be some killing machine. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but all you're doing is petty crime, you know? And he said, well, look, mate, you know, and this guy, he was a son of a, of a Black Power member who'd been in Lake Ellis. And, um, and and again, you know, the violence that was perpetrated on him since he was a basically a baby. Mm. And when he, when he was 12, I think it was, he pushed his father's car <laughs> out of the driveway on the road and stole it and drove off to Palmerston North and and um, went to his sister who, who was going with a mob member and the father caught him, beat the crap out of the mob member. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so he couldn't even stay there, so he ended up living under the bridge. So he was just basically a street kid. And how he survived, he said, look, he said, I didn't really commit burglaries. I, I just went in there to have a shower and, and to have a feed. And, and if I see a bit of clothing that, that fitted me, I'd, I'd take it. He said, but he said, I didn't really want to steal anything. I just want to have a shower, you know. Like, mm. and, and when you get that insight, and this guy's been in and out of jail all his bloody life, and they're all for this, this petty crime stuff. Yep. And, um, and he says, look... The one time I got on the benefit was I had a, I got my cousin to go into Windsor and couldn't read or write, you know, no schooling, and and so he got on on her unemployment benefit, but the cousin gave her bank account, oh, <laughs> so no. he never got a penny out of it. Oh, 